Hey everyone, I'm Molly Crabapple. Hey. So I'm so honored to be hosting the New York launch of Gabriella Coleman's Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy, which I had also had the honor of blurbing. And before we get into the gossip and scandal and giant hacks and great disputations, I want to start with a really, really basic question. What's anonymous? So, <clears throat> anonymous, you know, it is in some ways defined in over 400 pages in the book, um, but, you know, it is, it is no joke when it, I say it is a difficult kind of phenomena to define, but I think one of the important things to convey to those who may not know what anonymous is, is that the roots of anonymous lie in the fearsome world of internet pranking, which is often known as trolling. And it was a name that a lot of um, participants would take from the image board 4chan to target organizations and individuals. And then there was a very interesting shift in 2008 when they were targeting the Church of Scientology and they decided to kind of earnestly protest the church. And at that moment, they started to engage in activism. And today, it's a name that many different groups and individuals use to coordinate very diverse genres of collective action. And Anonymous, as you might guess from the name, is a group that is fiercely opposed to celebrity culture and even to individuals taking credit for their work. They have a quite obscene name for that. However, your book focuses on many characters, uh, many individuals who um, made up Anonymous. Could you speak to who some of those people are? Yeah, we wanted to make sure that we gave a little bit of a kind of basic sensor map of who Anonymous is. And one of the interesting and difficult things about writing a book is that on the one hand, I wanted to make sure that the important anonymous characters came through. So there's all sorts of people who contributed who are faceless. Uh, we don't know who they are in the real world. Uh, they operate by pseudonyms, so they have persistent nicknames, uh, but they've never been unmasked. But because Anonymous is known for its uh, digital direct action, which includes computer hacking and also distributed denial of service attacks where you overload a server with too many requests so you can't access it, many people have been arrested. And some of the kind of more famous characters uh, known to participate in Anonymous are Jeremy Hammond, who's a hacker who's now doing 10 years in jail. Uh, he, was in, he was caught in part by uh, a fellow called Hector Monsegur Sabu, who is from New York City, who became an informant. Um, then there's a couple of characters and hackers who were part of a group called Lulsec, which was a breakaway hacker group who went on a 50-day hacking spree. And some of those people are Mustafa al Bassam, who's from London. He's known as Tiflo. There was a hacker called Kayla, who pretended to be a 16-year-old girl. Um, and then, very famously, there was a character by the name of Barrett Brown, who's also been in jail for the last two years uh, for sharing a link, basically. And he was an interesting character because he arrived to Anonymous uh, without being anonymous, and he was given a lot of crap as a result. He did a lot of very important work, but nevertheless um, went against the central taboo, which is not to seek fame and celebrity. Yeah, I, I just reviewed uh, Gabriella's book for Book Forum, and I opened it by saying that I saw you speak in 2008 about Anonymous and how they were interesting and full of potential, and you talked about a lot of the more unsavory trolling things that they had done, the kind of cruel behavior. Uh, but you said, you insisted they had this political potential, and I didn't, at the time I was kind of skeptical. And in the review I mentioned that I kind of changed my mind on the first day of Occupy Wall Street when I noticed that they were really pushing this encampment, and I thought, okay, if they're a bunch of nihilists or a bunch of libertarians, then, you know, why are they getting on board with Occupy? So I was wondering if you could talk more about that political shift and maybe what some of your favorite you know, political hacks are? Like, what is it that made you take them seriously, seriously instead of, um, yeah, like what, I don't know, a few, a few of the, I'd love to hear just a few of your favorite uh, anonymous exploits. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to emphasize the world they came from is a highly, highly kind of cynical, anti-activist world, right? And again, they kind of made this turn to activism when they started to protest the Church of Scientology, but I really considered that 
a kind of historical mistake, just an aberration. They targeted the Church of Scientology, but many people kind of wanted to meet each other. They were anonymous trolls from the internet, and a lot of them are like, hey, let's protest the Church of Scientology, and they went ahead and, and, and did so, and met on the streets um, on February 10th, 2008. But that seemed very kind of insignificant because it was only in 2011 where they really started to get involved in some major, major political operations. And so some of the big ones are when WikiLeaks released uh, diplomatic cables and um, they pissed off a lot of governments around the world, um, a lot of governments kind of, or the US government convinced um, services like Amazon and MasterCard and PayPal to, to pull the plug on WikiLeaks, right? And a lot of the internet got incredibly pissed off at that moment. And Anonymous kind of swooped in and helped stage the largest uh, digital direct action protest by uh, providing resources for DDoSing PayPal and MasterCard. And that was a really incredible moment. I was there for that whole time, and Anonymous kind of organizes in chat rooms, and usually there's a couple of hundred people, and in this occasion there were 7,000 people that showed up and over 30, 40,000 people who kind of downloaded the tool for DDoSing to contribute. Soon after, they got involved in the Arab Spring, and that was also a very kind of important and surprising moment uh, because they kind of turned away from simple like internet issues. Um, and then they also went on hacking sprees soon after. And that is when, you know, things got really heavy and the state became incredibly interested in Anonymous. What is it about Anonymous that you think terrifies the state so much? I think there's a couple of things. Um, Anonymous has been really hard to commodify, and so a lot of leftist political movements um, usually can be co-opted through commodification. Um, their kind of edgy cultural currents are then represented in film or advertising. Well, because Anonymous uses kind of extremely offensive language, um, a lot of people don't want to touch them, right? So that's kind of one way in which they prevent a kind of commodification. The second thing is they hack into corporations, right? Um, and in so doing, they're seeking to find information that will reveal corruption. And in fact, there have been a couple of times where they've succeeded in that mission. So for example, in one case, they uh, hacked into a security firm called HB Gary. Uh, it was a bit of revenge hacking. They found some emails um, that included a proposal where the firm was trying to discredit journalists like Glenn Greenwald who supported WikiLeaks, right? And I think that's frightening because there's a lot of people with these skills who have the ability to kind of enter into these corporations and snatch things away. So again, between the fact that they're very hard to commodify and then also because um, they can kind of enter into corporations, uh, I do think that a lot of both governments and corporations do kind of fear them legitimately. Astra, what are your thoughts on that sort of commodification of dissent and how Anonymous resists that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one thing I remarked in my review that I thought, I thought you made that point really brilliantly in the book, is talking about how, what an unusual current it is for Anonymous to uh, resist a culture of celebrity for the individuals who are part of it, um, because we live in an age, I mean, in, in my book, The People's Platform, I kind of have a, a long part where I'm bitching about the idea of the personal brand and how all of these social media platforms enable that, and we can all quantify ourselves in these new ways, and I, I just kind of love that this group was saying no, and if, if you see, if you as an individual use your name and seek attention, we're going to condemn you. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it, har it harkened back to this sort of punk rock ethos of, of your, you know, wanting to stay underground in a way and wanting to invest their collective energy in this, you know, this name in common that other people can use. Um, so I found it kind of fascinating and it's interesting that there are sort of, there's power and risks associated with that, with the idea that anonymous can be used by anyone. Um, but that was also one of the fascinating things about Occupy Wall Street, right? Was that you didn't have to sign on even to a statement of principles to have an occupation. The name floated and was sort of open for others to latch onto and you know, sometimes you didn't like what you saw. Sometimes you wished that Occupy would stop having a drum circle because it was annoying and wasn't My th father <laughs> thought that was a psyop by the police yeah. to break people's spirits. To torture spirits. us. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, for me as a political organizer, I want there to be other other as other types of movements and to be disciplined movements and respectable movements and movements with goals and strategies and concrete wins. But I, I love that chaotic element that Anonymous allows, and I think there's a real power in that chaos that I, I would actually love to hear more on. Yeah, and maybe this is another reason why different... Um, governments and corporations fear them, they are so unpredictable. Um, oftentimes I'm asked, what's next? I'm like, I have no idea. Oh, now they're fighting the KKK today. Like, okay, how did that come about, right? And in part, one of the reasons why they're unpredictable is that they're reacting to world events and the, the world events are unpredictable, right? Um, so there were so many different moments, for example, when Anonymous got involved in publicizing rape cases, uh, when they got involved in police brutality cases, right? That always was a surprise. And you know, once you kind of do a post-mortem, it makes sense. Someone on the ground contacts Anonymous. Anonymous, someone involved has a personal interest. Um, someone tips off anonymous about an exploit, a vulnerability in a computer system, right? So there's reasons why you know one thing happens versus another, but nevertheless, you cannot predict it. And in, in many ways, you know, a lot of political movements become very predictable over time, and anonymous has now been in exi existence since 2008 till today, and has shifted kind of constantly, and you just can't predict its, its next moves. Anonymous is known f um, for its close collaborations with journalists, but you don't come from a journalistic background. You're an anthropologist by training. How do you think that that background and that method of working um, shaped how your book was made? So um, <clears throat> for those that may not know, an anthropologist basically sticks around for a really, really, really long time among the group of people that they study, right? So a journalist, uh, even let's just say a journalist does a kind of intensive um, long form piece. They may research a phenomena for one, two, three or four months. Whereas in my case, I was studying anonymous since 2008 and then between 2010 to 2012, it was a seven day commitment, five hours a day, sometimes seven. Um, and I was on sabbatical for one of those years, which really made that possible. And in retrospect, I sometimes am kind of like amazed by the amount of time that was kind of hunched over the computer. But that presence matters, you just don't go away. And so that means a couple of things. First of all, you see things over time and see major kind of changing points and inflection points. Another thing is that um, you see a lot of internal conflicts that happen and part of the book is to kind of convey those internal conflicts and then the final thing is that people put you to work uh, quite a bit as an anthropologist and this is you know not unique to my work in anonymous you're expected to do something you can't just kind of be a fly on the wall right you have to be a useful fly and in my case I kind of um, taught a lot of journalists how to find anonymous because they hang out in these chat rooms and I did a lot of media work explaining what they do and then because of that labor, they kind of come to trust you and confide in you. Um, so it's definitely that kind of longevity that makes the big difference. Um, and you definitely come to kind of get to know people personally um, over this, this period of time. And there's ways in which definitely I'm more sympathetic than less uh, to this entity, and we can talk about why. But you also you know, have people within the collective who don't like you, who attack you, right? I mean, it's not always fun and games just because you're an anthropologist and hang out. Uh, you become kind of an object of scrutiny like everyone else because you're there for so long. Anonymous. Uh, as a group has been riven with internal conflict. Uh, there are a lot of huge egos there. There have been a lot of fights. There have been a lot of fuck ups. Um, there have been a lot of uh, disagreements and splinter groups and like People's Front of Judea and Judean People's Front and Anonymous. Um, do you feel that writing about Anonymous was a bit of a minefield? Yeah, it was awful. I mean, <laughs> there was, my, my first book just felt very straightforward. I worked on open source hackers who believe in transparency and openness, and so they were very transparent, and it was just very straightforward. Whereas, you know, I had a master metaphor uh, for this book, which was the maze. And it wasn't simply a maze, but it was mazes within mazes, right? And it was a constantly shifting maze and a recursive maze. Um, and it was very disorienting, and at first it was extremely thrilling to be in the maze and figure out the puzzle, uh, but then after a while, when you you got lost and reached a dead end, you got really frustrated, 
And then once I kind of like figured stuff out, then I had to kind of go back and reconstruct a maze in a book, right? And that was also incredibly frustrating. But in the end, you know, I felt there was a kind of ethical imperative to do so in part because there's so many misunderstandings around anonymous. Everyone thinks it's just white middle class teenagers, uh, boys, which isn't the case. And then the second element has to do with the fact that so many geeks and hackers who are taking political action today um, are targeted by governments and facing very long jail times. And given this kind of um, crackdown against hackers, I also felt like, well, this is a difficult book to, to write, but nevertheless, I want to tell this story uh, because there's not many other people who, who can. Another metaphor that you use really skillfully, in my opinion, throughout the book is the metaphor of the trickster, of, you know, of Loki, of Anansi, of these mythological figures that on one hand, you know, could bring wisdom, but on the other hand, were, could like torture someone to death also, um, that were amusing and charming, but also sociopathic and cruel. And um, you use them as um, sort of a mythological grandparent of Anonymous. Can you talk a bit about the trickster archetype in Anonymous? Sure. Um, so one of the things about Anonymous that is so difficult is that they're morally slippery in many occasions, and it's very hard to kind of say uh, good, bad in a universal sense. And, you know, out in the world, there is a figure, the trickster, that really follows that logic where, you know, the point of the trickster isn't necessarily simply to come down on whether something is good or bad, but look at the effects of rule breaking in the world, right? And uh, in the kind of pantheon of the um, tricksters, you know, there's great examples of tricksters like Loki, who um, are figures that you know break so many rules all the time that they're just pissing everyone off and causing total fucking chaos, right? And I think that there's moments in Anonymous, especially in its trolling incarnations, that embody that spirit of of when you have like chaos with no sort of constraint. On the other side of the spectrum is if you don't ever break rules and norms, you really get the state of like utter conformity. And that's an extreme problem, whether it's just in society or political movements. And what I think I really like about Anonymous and its activist incarnations and why I kind of turn to the trickster is they kind of embody this spirit of mischievous rule breaking, but it's usually hinged to some political cause, so it's somewhat contained. But again, the trickster mythology often and some people accuse me of uh, using it to whitewash Anonymous, when in fact, if you look at the trickster myth, what's so interesting about it is that you have tricksters who are true hellraisers, right? And provide examples of what happens when there's kind of no controls when people are trying to break rules. But on the other hand, you have these instances in which you have a kind of uh, inclination to be mischievous and break rules, but it, it's, it's hinged to a sort of cause or event. But can you talk, I mean, but there are rules in Anonymous, right? There's the, the rule against fame seeking and there's a culture there, but is it an ideology? Like this is, you know, is, is Anonymous on the left? Is it, is it, what, is it just about the lulls? You know, so what, what are the rules that you discovered as an anthropologist? So one of the main rules and one of the only ones that kind of pertain to all the different networks and the troll era and the activist era is again against fame se seeking. It's really taboo to seek recognition for your work. And you know, a lot of people in Anonymous don't break the law. So you could, if you wanted, you could sort of say, hey, I made this video. And in fact, one of the things I did as an anthropologist was ma I made a video, anonymous video, with three other people. I think it's a pretty great video, you know, but I can't tell you what video it is, right? Uh, this is the whole point of anonymous, and that is really a living ethic, and I have all these moments in my book where people violated the norm and they were, you know, banished. Wow. Now, adios, you're out of here. So that's one. The other one is an interesting one, which is not to attack the media, actually. Actually. And there were very, very, very few instances where they ever did. And in fact, the one group that did attack the media was LulzSec, which broke away from Anonymous. And they had to break away from Anonymous because they were hacking for the lulls, not for political purposes. And so they felt like they couldn't stay within that domain. So it, 
it does show the kind of operation of some norms, but the problem is, you know, there is no general political philosophy or ideology. They don't have a kind of analysis of the economic system or injustice. They tend to be triggered by events and then go to those events, kind of like moths seeking light, right? Uh, and in that way, there's a kind of uh, flexibility and um, incoherence to their general political philosophy outside of that of celebrity seeking, you know, being a huge taboo. One of the critiques of Anonymous is really about its effectiveness. I'm going to um, back up a little bit here and talk about another hacking group, which is called Red Hack, which is a group of uh, Marxist Turkish hackers. They have been around for 16 years. Um, they're intensely disciplined, and they do hacks where they go into government databases and cancel people's debts or they um, will go into um, a database and uh, cancel the parking tickets for an entire city. They're uh, very concrete things that doesn't require a lot of uh, technological know-how to understand how they might affect people's lives. Um, whereas Anonymous has often been accused by its critics of being a fundamentally aesthetic movement where it's about you know, defacing a website or um, you know, hacking into someone's Twitter. Um, how would you... What, what, can you talk a bit about effectiveness, aesthetics, whether or not there's a contradiction, and um, what the effectiveness of Anonymous is? So on the one hand, definitely part of their effectiveness has to do with amplifying the role of the media when it comes to certain events, right? So in many, many of their cases, they're reacting to a journalistic piece. For example, um, when they first got involved in a rape case in Steubenville, Ohio, they were reacting to a very, very um, well-written New York Times piece about the case, and it was a very horrific case uh, of abuse where there had been a lot of social media documentation. And in some ways, what Anonymous does is swoop in and make Make sure that single issue lasts for more than two days. It lasts months. And we're seeing that with, you know, Ferguson, or we saw that initially where they kind of, you know, um, jumped in and helped make it into a national media story that then got its own legs. And I would say that's effective. You know, it just has to do with amplifying the role of journalism. Um, but the hacking also, I think, is really interesting. Um, and I think that there's two ways in which they were pretty effective. One of which was um, broadcasting the fact that security on the internet sucks, basically. Um, and a lot of security hackers and researchers were thrilled when, when LulzSec, the breakaway group, went on a hacking spree because it allowed them to go to their CEOs and go, look, you know, security is terrible. Um, and I know you usually ignore it because you, you don't do anything about it unless you're actually shamed, right? And this is interesting that we actually need to kind of shame corporations into improving security. And then the other element has to do with hacking into intelligence firms, as they did against H.B. Gary, Mantech, and Stratford. And what is interesting about these firms is that a lot of them are doing corporate spying, um, and it's really hard to find out about this information. They're not going to willingly give it over. You can't request a Freedom of Information Act for them. One of the only ways you're going to access this information is through whistleblowing by someone internal to the corporation or if someone hacks in. And some of the hacks definitely revealed kind of instances of, of corporate spying as well. One of the paradoxes of Anonymous is on one hand they're fierce advocates of privacy. Um, a lot of what they do about security on the internet is really this outrage that corporations have this incredibly personal data about people and they're so damn careless about it that you know, it could really fuck people over. But on the other hand, Anonymous um, very often dox people and every so often they dox, people wrong, they dox the wrong people. Um, can you talk about this tension between the privacy and doxing as a tactic? So for those that may not know what doxing is, it's when you reveal the personal identity of an individual and other personal identifiers, perhaps their social security number, their address. And so one of the kind of most controversial tactics within Anonymous is when they um, dox people not involved in the operation. So to give you an, a good example, uh, right here, uh, near Union Square, Anthony Bolonga, is that how you pronounce yeah, yeah. his name? Uh -huh. Right, yeah. pepper sprayed some woman. Pepper 
Exactly, and they, they you know, the, the protesters uh, weren't seemingly doing anything to deserve the pepper spray, and a young uh, activist in Anonymous, a female, kind of identified his name uh, by zooming in and zooming in and zooming in in the video, and she plastered it on, you know, the internet. And most people in Anonymous would say this is legitimate. We should know his name and what he did, right? Um, but then other people in Anonymous also doxed his uh, family members as well. His daughters and some of his, I think, brothers and sisters, right? And this is precisely the kind of activity that is uh, very controversial because they are kind of contradicting their own kind of commitment to privacy. And when you talk to kind of some individuals who do this because they tend to be a minority, they say, well, this is how we end up on CNN, for example. They're, pay they're playing the kind of sick media game where you often have to be very extreme to land this type of news. And this is not to justify it, but this is the kind of cycle that they're, they're in when they do that kind of extreme doxing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, one thing I really liked about your, about your book was that all of these debates that Anonymous ins inspires from in observers, it's like, is doxing ethical or not? Or is DDoSing really an effective technique that you you, you convey these really well in the chat logs, like showing how much debate there is. I mean, these tactics are not universally embraced by everyone. I mean, can you talk more about what you saw in terms of their culture and how they decide on targets and dissension within the ranks? Yeah, there's a sense that sometimes Anonymous does things um, mindlessly, and I would say they do things experimentally and sometimes in the heat of the moment. Uh, but they are kind of thinking through and debating a lot of what they do. And one of the things they also do, uh, which is interesting, is kind of link their own practices to the mainstream media as well. And so, for example, um, this year, uh, Newsweek, you know, engaged in one of the most famous, I think, of doxing uh, examples when they doxed Satoshi um, oh, yeah. the creator of Bitcoin, uh, they found him in LA. I mean, he was wrong, right? I mean, this is a perfect example of, you know, journalists getting wrong, Anonymous does something very similar, um, and they tend to be very, very well aware of, you know, what they're doing um, is very similar to certain journalistic dynamics, which they kind of critique, but then they also, you know, replicate quite a bit as well. So we're running out of time. Um, I'm going to talk about, this will be our last question. One of the things that we spoke about when we were getting coffee before this was how in the left there's this tendency to um, reach for perfection, to have all of people's words be right, to make sure like nothing is wrong, that no one fucks up. And that sort of perfection can be a very static thing. I mean, for me, I know nothing in the world is more deadly than a permitted street march where um, you've cleared it all with the cops and you have, you know, your governmental speakers uh, telling you to like, be patient, and you all wave your mass printed signs, and then you go home. To me, this is death. No one's interested, and um, yeah. it's dull as hell. And Anonymous isn't that. Anonymous fucks up. They use horrific language. They're funny. They're assholes. Um, sometimes they have a really short attention span, but they're also a space of anarchic joy. And that what, that's what makes them um, so attractive to so many people. Can we talk about spectacle and chaos and fucking up and sometimes how that's necessary? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think, again, one of the fascinating things about Anonymous is that they're myth makers, right? And one of the reasons why they're effective myth makers is precisely because they tap into some degree of chaos, anarchy, pleasure, um, disruption, and controversy, right? It's one of the reasons why people turn their attention to them. And I think it is really important to kind of create spaces where there's fantasy and art and narrative so that you can grab um, attention in a world on the internet where there's so many competitors for that attention. It is difficult in this kind of current moment of extreme, extreme, extreme media saturation to kind of get your message heard. Um, and Anonymous's spectacle kind of is effective in that regard. But independent of the kind of historical moment, you know, I do think um, a lot of humans in a kind of uh, universal sense really do um, turn to narrative and myth as a way to understand the world. Um, yes, in the West, we kind of downplay those enchanting qualities 
uh, and emphasize rationality and reason, and there's a really important role for rationality and reason. I don't want to entirely at all get rid of them, uh, but Anonymous shows how effective um, politics can be when you kind of marry the two. And maybe Astra can talk a little bit about it, because she has had, you know, when we were talking earlier, you had some interesting thoughts about it. It's interesting how technology is equated so much with openness and transparency in a kind of rationale, and which relates to, you know, even the idea is that you know, if people had have the truth, they'll see the light and come around. The sort of Chomsky idea that you just have to empirically give people the facts. And I think it's, so. It's interesting that these very tech savvy individuals are are going against reason and employing a kind of chaotic um, imagination. Um, I don't know. I found it, I found it kind of refreshing. I think because I come from uh, I'm I'm still involved in projects that emerge from Occupy Wall Street. So I do actually something called the Rolling Jubilee, which uh, just abolished twenty million dollars worth of health and medical debt. But I really wish we had just hacked and erased it instead of doing three years of work <laughs> <laughs> talking to debt brokers because it ruined a lot of my mornings. But um, <laughs> but Occupy comes from this other anarchist tradition, which fetish which kind of has a fetish for consensus and is uh, about prefigurative politics. So you embody the change. You want to be the change you want to see. So you're very, you know, kind, and you try to come to agreements. And and so I, I found it really an interesting counterpoint to go from this culture of consensus to one of antagonism and argumentation and a, a very different idea of democracy working with an anonymous uh, that, that I found fascinating and refreshing. And I kind of feel like you need both, you know, that a movement is dead if there isn't that excessive, unpredictable aspect out there. Um, and uh, yeah, and very sort of charming and surprising, even if a bit scary sometimes. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. I'll comment for the question, which is, um, I mean, the culture, the, the notion of the trickster is also a culture hero, as someone who founds cultures and then will crap all over this, the culture that he found, founds at the same time. So the, it's, it's a bigger role in, in, in some respects. My question for you is, is um, to what extent is, are the people in Anonymous really from the Rand Paul sort of the libertarian side, which is not the left, but is, it's the Snowden side. Snowden was, you know, Snowden's father was a big follower of, of Ron Paul. Even Ted Kaczynski, who was resorted to some strange things it was when and was a Luddite as well, was from coming from the concern he hated the left. Yeah. Absolutely hated the left. So the question is A, where are they coming from? And B, what does their action mean in terms of a sort of a resistance in the society going forward? Are these people capable of doing something or are they just effectively pointing out effectively holes in security which will be plugged by people who are and do and doing them a favor by doing so at the same time. But do you see a, lo a long term resistance kind of element in in anonymous playing into something else. Sure. Um, I'm super glad you brought up the question of, you know, who are these people? What is their offline political affiliations? I, th you know, there are definitely a lot of hackers who are libertarian, especially in the North American context. I would say more of them are, are actually civil libertarians, and some are classic market libertarians, and some are not. Anonymous does not follow that logic at all. At all. Some individuals may be libertarian, uh, but in fact, if Europe disappeared, uh, we would not have Anonymous. You know, there are so many European hackers who are heavily, heavily involved in Anonymous, and they come from very different political sensibilities. And to give you a sense of the kind of odd um, diversity of Anonymous, um, I like to use the example of LulzSec, which again is a breakaway group. Everyone involved in LulzSec was also an anonymous. So you had uh, Hector Monsegur, who was a Puerto Rican from uh, here in New York City living in the housing projects. Uh, I don't think his politics were libertarian at all. You had um, Mustafa al Bassam, who was a 16 year old Iraqi immigrant. And I also don't think like he had any well formed offline political um, sensibility. He came of age to politics through anonymous, uh, defending piracy in certain ways. You had two Irish. Um, college students, one who had a very well-developed political sensibility because his father had been in the Irish Republican Army. Um, he had been jailed, his father, and he had been kind of a hacktivist since he was 15 years old. You had an ex-military who had served time in Iraq, and then you had an anti-capitalist anarchist, Jeremy Hammond, right? I mean, what an odd mix of people. 
And so, you know, people come to Anonymous with very different political sensibilities from leftist anarchists to libertarian to social democrats to like having no politics except Anonymous itself, right? And in fact, I think it's the pseudo anonymity where you cover yourself that allows for the coming together of unlike people. Uh, in terms of their kind of long-term kind of effectiveness and their goals, I mean, again, a lot of the hacking is to seek um, information that can be leaked for political change. One of the most exciting leaks that came in the last uh, few months came at the hands of LulSec Peru, so a Latin American um, hacker group who broke into the Peruvian government, uh, downloaded emails that showed extreme corruption, and the cabinet was one vote away from resigning because of these emails. Um, I think that they're not just simply trying to expose the sorry state of security. They're just trying to intervene in the pragmatic ways that they can, which tend to be, again, um, limited to what they can exploit, whether it's an event or a security hole. What you're saying about um, LulSec Peru is, um, I think, very important because there's a delusion that a lot of people have, not just with Anonymous, but with the internet and with social media, that everyone on it are like privileged white kids or everyone on it are, you know, like white American boys like hanging out in their parents' basement, but it's simply not true. You know, hackers are a global group and people on social media are a global and massively diverse group. And um, I think that the work you're doing pointing out those groups is very, very important for fighting that really false stereotype. Any uh, questions? Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, all of you guys. Um, so in the first few pages of your book, you describe um, lulls as being a quasi-mystical state of being. And uh, you also just spoke very eloquently about the relationship of anonymous and hackers to um, trickster archetypes like Loki and Anansi, which are, are really instrumental in the way cultures have historically always thought about themselves. And I think that's really interesting in relation to the sort of um, like nihilistic and apathetic origins of anonymous and hacking that people speak to. And I'm just curious if you have anything to say maybe about um, a dedication that anonymous or people who ascribe to this like lulzy thing may actually have to sort of a, a higher kind of not a higher power, but like this this myth making and this this sense of belonging to something really big above a lot of different kinds of categories and in, in contradiction to how they might be seen. Yeah, I mean, I think um, they a lot of people. I mean, I, I I like that you mentioned the fact that um, you know trolls can be very nihilistic, and one of the things. I think it's important not to celebrate kind of every anonymous action, but I am really glad that um, a culture of cynicism where there's a lot of political apathy, in that context you still had people kind of rise up and decide to enter into the political arena. So in the end, I think it's a kind of hopeful story. And one of the reasons why I think that transformation happened is that even though Anonymous may not have a single political ideology, people do feel like they're part of something important and bigger than themselves, right? And that kind of commitment where you're kind of exceeding the self and part of this kind of collective intervening in the world is in some ways what kind of nourishes them and, p and keeps people going. In fact, Sabu, who is this informant, one of the kind of puzzling things was that he was doxxed by a kind of hacker group and his name was revealed in March 2011 when he was caught four months later and one of the puzzling things was why didn't he just go dark right he saw his name he was on law enforcement's radar and uh, I'm pretty sure this is what mattered in his life right this is where he he garnered meaning um, in a very kind of intimate way and so the, the myth making isn't simply interesting from a kind of um, cultural, political perspective, but from the people involved, it's you know one of the reasons why they tend to sort of be so attached to a collective that is otherwise so amorphous. That actually sort of segues into what I was going to ask. Can you use the? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, after Sabu's arrest was announced, obviously there was a lot of anger toward him from Anons. Um, but since then, there have been various um, 
documents revealed through Freedom of Information Act requests indicating that there have been other informants within Anonymous. My question is, why do you think that so many people within Anonymous and in the media seem to really fixate on Sabu and either downplay or ignore the existence of other informants who are known to have existed and probably still do exist. There are probably many informants and undercover agents, but it seems like no one really talks about them. They just fixate on Sabu. So why is that? I mean, part of it is that he's such an interesting character because he defies every stereotype of a hacker. You know, he's Puerto Rican. He lives in the hood. He doesn't live in a basement. He was a drug dealer. Um, you know, he just, he's a fast, he is a fascinating cultural figure, right? And I think that's part of it. And then the, the other part is that um, even though it's known that there's other informants, we're not 100% sure who they may be, even though there are sometimes some big clues, like people who were on channels where uh, law-breaking activity was happening, and now they seem to be out and in public. Like, that just is odd, right? I mean, that should not be the case. Um, but when you just actually don't have 100% proof, um, you know, there's a lot of rumors and a lot of accusations, but in the end, you know, you just can't simply prove it. And having a figure who actually exists, who you can sort of, you know, point to where there is actual proof becomes an easier object to kind of meditate around. But practices have shift, shifted because, um, you know, it was revealed that there were informants. People's security got better. Some of the hacking became more quiet. And a lot of the hacking is now happening offshore in Latin America, uh, in parts of the world where, where uh, resources for cyber crime enforcement are, you know, don't run as deep as they do in the United States. Oh, yes. Thank you, sweet. All right, then. Now, this goes into a code of ethics when it comes to anonymous. Maybe it, trans maybe it transfers, maybe it intersects with the political ideology behind them, but I come from St. Francis College, who you presented to this past Thursday. And... In presenting there, you showed a forum post on 4chan where Anonymous basically had their start that featured you being banned over exposing your studies on the organization. And they gave you titles I would rather not personally <coughs> reproduce verbatim, but seemed very androgynous. So in this case, even though the ethics of the group may contradict themselves, do you think it's in that androgynous point of view where men have always been on the internet, whereas women are coming into the fold and so on and so forth, addressing that trope, that sort of taboo? You mean a sexist? Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> so uh, first of all, um, the image that the young man is referring to was uh, when Anonymous was still trolling. And yeah, they were trying to troll me because I was uh, studying them. And there were very, very unsavory things uh, said about me. And thankfully, some odd reason the trolling campaign, you know, never took off. And I do want to make clear that I find that form of, you know, trolling and targeting of, of individuals like, yeah, terrible. You know, it's it's the whole reason why I think the shift towards um, activism, where they stop targeting individuals just for the sake of doing so, so important, right? Um, what they've retained is the use of sexist language. Uh, so on the activist chat channels, they will still bandy about racist and sexist uh, language, and this, you know, continues to be very controversial. Uh, not so much within Anonymous, people are quite comfortable with that because they're so not politically correct. They feel that language is something that um, tends not to harm, you know, it tends to be a kind of naive vision of, of how language works, uh, but it is a kind of culture that embraces transgression and subversion, um, and it is, you know, 
done somewhat reflexively uh, within that domain, right? And among the activists, they're not necessarily using that kind of sexist language to attack people. Again, it's not necessarily to kind of justify it, but I do think it's important to differentiate the troll um, kind of embrace of sexism, which then is hinge directly to targeting individuals and harassment and what happens in Anonymous where they do it to kind of continue in the tradition of subversion from which they came. And I don't know if you want to kind of comment on that no, at I mean, all. It just seems like it's almost like a, so, I mean, I'm not an anthropologist, but a kind of social glue. Like, and you always make your group by excluding others. And it seems like that's, that's certainly one of their biggest failings. Uh, right, and, and one of the reasons why, you know, they often say anonymous can be anyone and everyone, right? And um, I've had some, you know, very interesting moments where, for example, once um, uh, an 80-year-old Canadian man uh, emailed me trying to find anonymous, and I, I told him how to find them. I'm not sure if he ever did. Uh, but, you know, anonymous tends to be geeks and hackers, right? Uh, it tends not to be anyone and everyone, but there's a lot of geeks and hackers in the world, right? So diversity comes from the fact that there's hundreds and thousands of geeks, but they do have these strong social boundaries, and, and you know the strongest one is their offensive language. I, I actually had a question. Um, one of the most hilarious parts of your book is, I believe you're at TED, and a corporate, like sort of futurist yeah, firm, asks you how they can harness the energy of LulzSec to build their brand. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah. So one of the fascinating things about working on Anonymous is that since people could not understand them, I got kind of tapped by all sorts of different groups and organizations from venture capitalists um, to corporate executives to TED to kind of security specialists to law enforcement to kind of, you know, reveal something about anonymous and there was this funny contradiction where in the corporate world people wanted to kind of exactly have me offer some sort of lesson from the world of anonymous to fortify their kind of corporate brand culture or, or organization on the other hand they hated anonymous right and so after i gave my uh, ted talk um you know some members of the audience who came from you know high levels of the corporate world kind of clutched me and sort of said you are so brave you are so brave to study anonymous and they were kind of like projecting their own fear of being hacked right because i didn't find studying anonymous particularly scary except for the law enforcement part probably um, and again i was in a un unique position i do understand why certain individuals or corporations were scared but there was that odd contradiction where they wanted to kind of capitalize and you know learn from anonymous on the other hand they wanted to do everything possible to kind of make them go away from from the planet so what is one inspirational lesson from lulsec for how to improve the morale of your sales force Pirate imagery sells well. <laughs> Next question. And this is the last one we have time for tonight. Uh, hi, I just wanted to uh, check if you had seen the Hacker Wars documentary and get your thoughts on that if you had seen it. I actually haven't. I'm, I'm dying to watch it. So maybe we can take one more question because I haven't seen it. The woman that's in the purple? Yeah. Hopefully I'll watch it soon. I have a very simple question. I'm curious, um, now that your book has come out, what, was, ha, what has been the reaction from Anonymous mm -hmm. to the publication of your book? So generally it's been pretty positive. Um, one of the surprising things, for example, from some of the hardcore participants, like Jeremy Hammond, who has read the book, um, was that he learned stuff. Because a lot of kind of geeks and hackers who get really involved, you know, become their own historians and archivists, and they understand their history very well. This is true for all hackers, I would say. But definitely when there's one person, and this is, you know, speaks to Molly's question, one of the differences between a journalist and an anthropologist is you try to get a really holistic view and try to learn as much as you can. And then I kind of threw that out in the book, and I think a lot of people were surprised, people who knew quite a bit. 
Um, on the other hand, you know, some, some people are not thrilled that there's someone representing Anonymous. There is a drive within Anonymous to follow the rules of Fight Club. You know, the first rule of Fight Club is not to talk about Fight Club, and I've talked about Fight Club, and now I've written 400 pages on Fight Club, right? And so there's a small contingent who definitely are extremely mad that this book has been published. And then one of the difficult things about it, too, is that, you know, um, I definitely, while I come out in favor of Anonymous, I um, show some very kind of ugly moments, even in its activist incarnations, and some of the huge conflicts. And in some ways, I'm airing people's dirty laundry, right? And on the one hand, I would say most people are thrilled that that's the case, because it's important for people within the movement to have someone representing things accurately. But obviously, some people whose dirty laundry has been aired are not necessarily like totally thrilled as a result. So as I like to say, you know, um, when you write a book on Anonymous, you're going to piss off over 9,000 people. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, proving to be very interesting, the reactions that I'm getting. Awesome. Well, that's all the time we have for our program this evening. On behalf of the Strand, thank you so much, Gabriella, Molly, and Astra for joining us.